sometimes I would just go on because that's the way it is. And the stupidity is that's not the way it is. You don't have to be in pain constantly. You don't have to feel bad. You don't have to cry. I start carnivore and within days, I'm like full of energy, ready to go. Before it was not that way. You have no idea. I'm 16 years old and I'm lying down on a floor, curled up in the fetal position and like rocking around trying to stop the pain. Hi, everybody. Today we're joined with my good friend, Alia. Thank you for being with me today, Alia. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I, I'm look, looking forward to this discussion and uh, ways that we could help everyone in their carnivore journey. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself for those that don't know you? Sure. Uh, my name's Alia. I'm a mom of two kids, five and seven. Um, I identify as a mom more than anything else. So that's why I always <laughs> introduce myself like that. Um, born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and um, I've always in my life, what is it called, had, what is it called, wonderlust, where you can't like stay in one place for too long. So I'll blame that on my parents for moving every year <laughs> <laughs> within Chicago. And then uh, starting at 16, I was out of the house, just kind of traveling the U.S. And then I found myself at uh, 32 in uh, South America. And oh, wow. uh, I found my husband down here in Columbia and uh, we wanted to start a family. So that's the that's the fast version. <laughs> I love oh. to travel. I can't stay in a place for more than two years. That's why I've never got braces. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> no, seriously, I was going to get them like, but we're not even going to be here for two years. Like, what am I going to do if I have braces in my mouth and we leave? Anyways, you can cut that out if you want. <laughs> but that's just a little bit about my personality. Like, I'm like, where can we travel to now? Where can we, what do we want to explore next? Anyways, and it's great that my husband is the same way. Awesome. So yeah. was, it, was it love at first sight for you too? No, mm -mm, not at all. No, oh. I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> no, not interested. But, um, you know, it's, it's amazing what a good haircut will do. <laughs> <laughs> and persistence on the other person's part. That's funny. Hmm. I love that. So you obviously are on a cardboard journey. What kind of led you to that? Um, so after I had kids, I, or when I got pregnant with my son, I gained 80 pounds, but that was just me eating like everything. I wanted to try everything with him. I was like always wanting to eat hamburgers and French fries. This was like the main thing I was craving. Um, but then I would at night, like, oh, the weird thing that I was craving. And you wouldn't think you would gain weight with this, but you will frozen mango i was just downing the frozen fruit as much as i can you know you have these pregnant you don't know but women know you have pregnancy cravings and that was my that and ice was like my pregnancy craving so but i was eating ice cream i was just eating a ton of crap and in no time flat i gained 80 pounds um and then i had a pretty traumatic childbirth experience and i'm bringing that up only because um i believe that contributed to destroying my thyroid or harming my thyroid because apparent I read that traumatic experiences like that organ is very sensitive to trauma. Um, and so I don't want to get into the whole birth story, but it was just several days and it ended up in emergency C-section. Um, oh, wow. and then I was hospitalized for, I don't know, 10 days afterwards with a infection from the C-section. So all of that, I believe contributed to my thyroid being wrecked. Um, so after that, it's been very hard for me to lose weight. So pregnant, get out of the hospital or uh, have a baby, get out of the hospital. When you have a baby, it kind of like throws your body out of whack, especially if you're eating horribly. And then, you, then the sleep deprivation starts. <laughs> like, which actually with Jacob, with Jacob, he was fine. He was a very good sleeper. He slept through the night. He slept probably the first year of his life, like 80% of the time. He was a very good sleeper. Um, but anyway, so I'm nursing. I have a brand new baby. I'm a new mom. I stopped nursing around nine or 10 months. He just wanted a bottle. So that was a very easy pr process. This, there's a point to all of this because women will understand that all of these things like wreck your hormones. 11 months or so later after Jacob was born, I was pregnant again with Brianna. This was in my mind plan though. But in retrospect, if I would look at it physically, I probably shouldn't have done that. But mentally, spiritually, it's what I wanted to do to have my babies really close to each other. But it did have ramifications on my body. So 
going to my first pregnancy, I was like 150 pounds ish, maybe 160. At the end of that pregnancy, I think I was like 215. It was the biggest I'd ever been in my entire life. Uh, and then I just kept the weight just kept increasing. And I think when I was first pregnant with my daughter, I was maybe around 220. Like the baby weight that you gained didn't come off because I found out right before I got pregnant again that my thyroid was messed up. Like mm -hmm. I had a thyroid condition at that point. And when you have a thyroid condition, um, one of the symptoms is weight gain with, and hard to lose weight. So, okay, now I'm pregnant with my daughter. Uh, we go back to Colombia. I have my daughter in Colombia. That pregnancy, I almost, I had a very hard time eating just in general. So I happened to have lost some weight. Mm -hmm. But I never went back down. I'm still not back down to my pre-Jacob pregnancy weight. Um, and I'm going to get to that in a second. I nursed her for three and a half years. She's a terrible sleeper. She would keep me up so many nights. So that's when the sleep deprivation started. <laughs> like <laughs> Netflix was my best friend between two and four in the morning. <laughs> and then I'm already up and maybe she'd fall back to sleep and I would just stay up and watch TV until I fell asleep. This happened night after night after night. And then I'd be working the next morning. I actually don't know how I worked. I'm not sure because I did not have a lot of sleep. And so all of these things contribute to destroying your body. Like I probably ate better here than in the U.S. Absolutely. I wasn't going to fast food restaurants and things like that because that's not the culture here. However, I still wasn't eating good in the middle of the night eating oatmeal or bread or because they have delicious bread here or whatever and not sleeping. If you don't sleep, you're never going it, to. It's very hard to lose weight. My mm -hmm. saving grace is that I nursed for three and a half years, which burns a lot of calories. <laughs> yes, I said that. Three years and almost four months nursing my little girl, uh, which I think was great for her health because that is so good for a child to be nursing them. In Colombia, they want you to nurse for at least two years. Uh, and two years rolled around and um, I couldn't get out of it. I wanted to, but I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> so that ended. And, you know, I think my hormones were screwed up. I didn't have a menstrual cycle for years. That will screw you up. It's, I know we hate our menstrual cycles, but if we have to have that hormonal cycle happening or it really screws with your mind. I used to cry at the drop of a hat. Um, it was just rough. Those years of being pregnant and nursing were very rough for me without sleep and not knowing really what the proper human diet was. I did, during that time, search, uh, watch a lot of Dr. Berg and I thought my keto was like, and then I tried doing keto and I always fell off of it. Um, I would eat a lot of like dry chicken compressed in like iceberg lettuce salads with all these vegetables. And sometimes I would do like fish and like very low fat protein. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I, my fat would be like olive oil, which would make my stomach feel weird. And, and, you know, maybe some butter and I'm just being general, but this is went on for years. And then my, the weight went off a little bit, maybe got down to like 180 and then just back up to like 200, 215. And, and so this went on for six years and I would cry often about my weight. I would cry about how I looked and how I hated how I looked. And just remember this people, because I'm going to get back around to this specific point in a second. Um, so, and so I've been like, I guess you would say obsessed, obsessed with losing weight. And it just didn't work. And it didn't make any sense to me because before I had kids, if I wanted to lose weight, I would just, I knew that I just didn't eat carbohydrates and I would just lose the weight and I would be happy. Mm -hmm. Happy. You get, you get what I'm saying? For sure. Uh, because that's not your, happiness doesn't come from how you look or how it's like how more so how you feel. Do you get what I'm saying? Not mm -hmm. like, so, yeah. so it's almost like a mental trick you play because in, our society, not here actually, but in the US, you know, you see like Margot Robbie, you see uh, Angelina Jolie, you see all these like super beautiful women and 99% of us don't look like that. Right. So we have this ridiculous set of standards of what beauty is and you have that in your mind, you know, or what weight is an appropriate healthy weight or a good looking weight, a sexy weight, a beautiful weight, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but if you're like me and you love food, you have this crazy thing happening where you want to have this thing, but you can't have this thing, or you want to have that food, but you shouldn't have that food. So these 
put a lot of stress into a woman, I think, these things. <laughs> so, all right, let's fast forward to um, about a year and a half. Uh, a couple of years ago, I heard about the carnivore diet on Dr. Berg's channel, and I was like, huh, yeah, not for me. I want my vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then I think it was like about a year ago, more or less, Dr. Berg interviewed a gentleman who has a YouTube channel. His name is Tristan Haggard. And he's talking about not weight loss. He's talking about how he's handled back pain, all this inflammation, all these like various things changed by eating meat. And I'm like, that's really interesting because I've had chronic back pain forever, like a really long time. But I'd be like, ah, oh, my back hurts so much eating uh, spicy Cheetos. <laughs> right. Not correlating the two that they actually have something to do with each other. If you eat terribly, your your body's going to feel terrible. And I had no idea about that concept ever that what you put in your body, except if I ate ice cream, I know my stomach would hurt. Like if I eat like, I knew if I ate like two McDonald's cheeseburgers, uh, my stomach would hurt afterwards. But I didn't know the other ramifications that it created in your body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thanks to Tristan Haggard, thanks to Dr. Berg, actually, uh, interviewing Tristan Haggard, I fell down the carnivore rabbit hole. And eventually, at that same period of time, I kept getting uh, on my YouTube home screen, like, Dr. Berry, Dr. Berry, Dr. Berry. And in my mind, um, I don't want to, like, I want to stick to one person, not because I'm, like, loyal or dedicated to, like, a YouTuber. I just don't want to be confused because there's so much conflicting data. Right. In the universe, in on the internet. So I never. So it took me a long time. And then one day I'm like, all right, I'm gonna click on this guy because YouTube keeps showing it to me. And then, within seconds of that southern accent, I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I watched a bunch of his stuff. And then I tried around Christmas, la right before Christmas last year, I started keto for because I still wanted to eat vegetables. And then Christmas came, and I I fell hard. Uh, and then. One day, at the beginning of this year, I'm like, March 1st, that's it. I'm going to do hardcore, my version of hardcore carnivore. And um, I was amazed. So a few things I didn't mention. I mentioned the back pain. Uh, for years, I've had, like, IBS symptoms. Again, like, it's not that I don't care about my body. It's just like, oh, I guess that's the way it is. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if I would have, if I would have gone to a doctor, they would have told me to eat bananas and rice to stop diarrhea. And that, that would just make me fat. <laughs> Do you right. Know what I'm right. Absolutely. Or take, some, or take some medicine, which has other, possibly take some medicine that has other bad ramifications. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes I would just go on because that's the way it is. And the stupidity is that's not the way it is. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be in pain constantly. You don't have to have sleep deprivation. You don't have to feel bad. You don't have to cry about your weight. Okay, so I'm not sleeping for very well for years. Back pain, uh, gut issues. Um, look in the mirror. I hate how I look, uh, which is a mental thing, you right. know, more than a, a physical thing. And so then I start, uh, I start carnivore, and within days, it felt like uh, my sleep started resolving. I started waking up at 5 a.m. I wake up every day very early now. I'm like full of energy, ready to go. Before it was not that way. I mean, I still do drink my. <laughs> I still drink my coffee. I love coffee. But um, it was in days. Like the things that changed in days were crazy to me. I think I lost 12 pounds in 21 days. Three weeks in, I was like, oh my God, my back pain's like 85% gone. It's it, but like literally chronic 20 years back and shoulder pain. Uh, That's terrible. Incredible. Yeah, it's terrible. And, and you're like, oh. and I would be like, these are the things I would ask my husband for help. How do I lose weight? Can you give me a massage? I just like too many complaints. I didn't ever care about how I looked. Like that was never, I could be skinny. I could be fat. It didn't matter. He hated how much complaining I did. I'm, I'm like, it's like <laughs> conditions. And he was worried. And so now I start eating this way and all these things just start resolving like automatically. And so, so I stuck with it until November. <laughs> then I fell off, but I'm back. Don't worry. Don't worry, people. I'm back. But and then I saw the reverse happen. I saw when I was visiting home recently, when you reverse these, when you go back to the weight, the pain comes back. You're, you're, you're having problems pooping again, whatever those problems are. Your stomach hurts. Your, your back starts hurting. You're, you're getting like antsy and angry easily. Like just the stress level. And it's all because you're poisoning yourself. 
Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I just want to say, like, I'm not a perfect carnivore. I like stevia. Uh, sometimes I like, you know, I tried jalapenos. Bad idea. Like, I know there's people that are like, meat, salt, water, no coffee. That's it. And I'm like, you know, super low carb. And I like it that way. And I love steak. So call me what you will. Call me what you will. But <laughs> well, I definitely it's recommend. Di- it's still up for debate anyways with what percentage of your diet is considered carnivore. So I guess that's different oh, yeah. for different people. I don't yeah, think there's any hard and fast rule on that. Yeah, different strokes for different folks. Uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, I was reading on Dr. Kiltz's website that in the animal kingdom, a super carnivore is somebody that uh, an animal that eats 70% of its food is meat. I don't. So what else are they eating then? What's the other 30%? But if you right. eat seven, in the animal kingdom, 70% animal based is a super carnivore. So. Right. Wow. Uh, someone can check his website and check me if I'm wrong. On there that, you go. But. <laughs> but you started carnivore diet because basically you just kind of wanted to feel better, uh, maybe lose some weight. And, and no, I was at my that. wits end. I was done. I'm like, that's it. This has to work. Nothing else has worked. And somehow in my heart of hearts, I knew that this was the solution. And so I made the plunge. <laughs> After but, I, I believed it, I knew it was going to work. I knew it was going to work for me. Awesome. So, so after you started the carnivore diet and you started to see some positive results, was there anything else that, that it helped out with that maybe you didn't realize it would do at first? Sure. Sure. So the, the big, the big elephant in the room was this crazy thing that, um, so I like to talk about my menstrual cycle. So get ready, ladies, let's go down this trip. Okay. Um, I track my menstrual cycle for various reasons on an app on my phone and um three weeks in three weeks in eating carnivore my my period showed up and i was like oh that's weird but what was weirder was like i was like wait where's the pain and the agony where's the pain so <laughs> starting at around 13 years old because that's the first time i remember this and maybe it wasn't every single one but i remember just sitting um and I was studying something. And uh, my friend looks at me and he's like, you look terrible. And I was sitting there like feeling pain I've never experienced before in my life. Like pain that starts from like your your uterus and it just started creeping in it up my body. And I started sweating. And I felt if I think back and if I pretend like in my mind I was looking at myself, I was like super pale. I was shaking. I was having chills. And it was because my period started. I mean, it had started earlier than that, but that moment I was going through a cycle and I'm like, he's like, you need to go home. So I went home, I took a hot bath and I just remember the correct word is writhing around in my bed, in my parents' bed actually, until I fell asleep. I was in so much pain and I'm like, what's going on? Um, but me, I, I don't know why as a teen, I didn't ask my mom about this. I didn't understand, you know, I, I love my mom, but I never really, we never talked about stuff like that for whatever reason. And, um, you're supposed to be able to talk to your mom about this stuff and I don't blame her and I don't blame me. We just didn't. Do you get what I'm saying? So, right. um, so now this didn't happen every month, but I, until maybe my twenties then, or late teens. So I'm 13. I don't remember really another incident until late teens and then i remember maybe 16 okay maybe i had a couple years grace after that i don't really remember some pain Mm -hmm. but nothing like that where i'm where i am pale and i like i feel like you just don't understand you have no idea Mm -hmm. so next time i my next image is i'm 16 years old and i'm lying down on a floor like curled up in the fetal position and like rocking around trying to stop the pain so this went on pretty much until my 20s. And uh, then I found this magical thing that a gynecologist gave me called the pill. Oh, and, wow. it, and I didn't know that that would help my menstrual cycle. And so this was like this beautiful thing. If you are in so much pain in your 20 or something, you're going to do whatever the doctor says. That's why I was mentioning, we just go to a gynecologist. They're going to tell you. But they, I didn't, they didn't say anything else. And I, I said I have like pain and, uh, you know, I'm in my 20s. Of course, I don't want to get pregnant. You know what I mean? Just to be honest, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. But I didn't realize that this 
magical thing not only would stop pregnancy but it would also stop the pain and for me that sort of almost almost mm -hmm. it made it like you know bearable where i only wanted to kill you i didn't want to just go in a corner and die like it brought the pain to it the next level <laughs> That's pretty bad. I don't, I'm not talking about, I just want to clarify, I'm not talking about self-harm, but when you're in so much shame, you're like, just go find a rock and go hide under it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'll give like another example. So, so I'm on and off the pill and when I'm on it, it helps. Uh, but I kind of, you know, I didn't, and I was a smoker at the time, which was, if you're smoking and you're on the pill, that's so dangerous. That's so like it gives you a warning, like you could get a blood clot, but I'm like 20 and stupid. You know what I mean? Like, right. you don't care. You're invisible. Oh, happened to me. Right. Um, <laughs> so just to like explain this pain again. So mid 20s, I get my three wisdom teeth withdrawn. I get something called dry socket, which is also incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very painful. It's like getting hit. There's it, the clot like falls off. So you have like, nerve endings open and until it naturally heals you're feeling this like baseball bat pain Ouch. in the face so i'm bringing that up because that dental operation coincided with my menstrual cycle and um i was on for that pain vicodin or some fake by generic vicodin and tylenol 800 and i was like oh my god no pain <laughs> <laughs> zero i can't feel anything i can't even feel my mind <laughs> i feel like it's on me but there's no pain right so that i'm explaining this because the amount of pain that that caused me almost every month uh like clockwork biking got rid of the pain and biking is a heavy 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 like opiate so if you're taking you have to take narcotics for your pain there's something wrong mm-hmm so I didn't continue my bike in journey because I felt how psychotic I felt when I was taking it. I'm like, okay, well, this is not good. So in my mind, feeling the pain is better than being a total lunatic. I know. Scaring yourself. <laughs> yeah. So I had to like wean myself off of that stuff after a couple of weeks um, because of that, the pain was gone. I'm like, and I was like sleeping with my my Vicodin. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. It was like by my head. So oh. it was my little experience with like drug addict, dr how drug addict, I wasn't a drug addict, but I could understand instantly how drug addicts were. And that was crazy. So I'm glad I was aware enough to get myself weaned off of it mm -hmm. uh, over a period of a week or two. And then, yeah, but now let's confront the pain again. So this was like a major thing. Imagine going through life dreading like three days of every month. Like you don't know how bad you're going to feel. And um, I think so in my twenties, I started asking people like, I have this extreme pain. Like, and I think this is where I got the idea. I was asking girlfriends. I wasn't asking doctors, you know, I have this extreme pain. They're like, oh yeah, I have period cramps also. So then I think, oh, oh, this is normal. This excruciating pain that is debilitating is super duper normal. Everybody has it. I just, I guess I can't, I can't confront, I can't handle pain. I have a low threshold of pain is literally what I thought for years. Okay. So I'm doing carnivore and my, oh, I have babies, don't have a period for years. Finally, when it comes back, it's totally different experience. I still have some pain, but it's like a totally different experience. Um, I was talking to nurse Kim. She's got a YouTube channel and she said, when you have this condition, after you have kids, it doesn't, Sometimes it's like dormant. It doesn't come back full force. But there were times that I would be uncomfortable or not want to do anything. But it was never the same as it was. So I just want to put that like little disclaimer out there. Um, if you have endometriosis, have babies. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, because uh, one of the symptoms is you can't get pregnant. So it's crazy that I got pregnant if that's what I really had. Like I said, I never got it diagnosed. But the amount of pain that I felt. I don't know what else it could possibly be. And I'm sure it was diet related. Um, I'm sure smoking absolutely didn't help and just made matters worse because that also does terrible things to your body and your hormones, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but like on the diet, I love, I love French fries. I love hamburgers. If you were to ask me like, what was my favorite food? I would still say hamburgers and French fries. Um, but I think that hamburgers were probably the reason I got pregnant because everything else was crap in the meat. 
the red meat that I would always, that's another thing. During my menstrual cycle, when I could eat again, I would be craving hamburgers. I would say, I'm so hungry. I don't know how many times in my life I've said, I'm so hungry I could eat an entire cow right now. Like subliminally, my body was trying to tell me something. Like I could be eating cows. <laughs> Anyways, so I was a big meat eater, but only around my my menstrual cycle was I super craving it. And now looking back, that's like a signal. Like maybe I need to be eating more red meat in my life. And maybe that would resolve this hormonal issue because it's definitely a hormonal thing. Um, three weeks into my, now we're back to, to, to more closer to present three weeks in, I have this menstrual cycle. and I'm like, I have no pain, like nothing, like what's going on here. And, um, I do have some weird pain in the middle of the month, which is definitely hormonally related. And it lasts for about one hour, but it, it's, it's kind of intense. It's like I'm going into labor or something for like one hour. It's pretty crazy. And I think that also has something to do with this condition. But my actual menstrual cycle, which is what I've had the problem with my whole life. Now I'm like, wow, there's like very little cramping, maybe a little bit of discomfort, which is probably normal because you're shedding some lining inside of your body. But right. not excruciating pain, not debilitating pain that only women <clears throat> who have this condition can fully understand because obviously my girlfriends didn't. <laughs> That's normal. Yeah. <laughs> rolling, rolling around on the floor in pain is normal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're saying I have to go home. I can't work today. And then they're like, no, every woman has a period. But it's not the, it's not the same. And I don't know. So I just, you know, I had a couple jobs where I had my own office. So I would just lock the door. I wouldn't tell. I would be like, I would just lock the door. I would take some pain meds. I would lie down several hours with a like a heater and a heating pad. And I would just lie down there. I'm like, sorry, can't go home. So I'll just not work here. You want me to not work at home or you want me to not work here? I'll lock the door. <laughs> wow. That's, or that's I'm just walking intense. around like like a seriously like an axe murderer. Like I can't move. I'm in, like slowly walking and I'm going to kill you. Like. Pain is so closely related to anger. <laughs> for sure. So, so so that's effectively resolved for you now. Yeah. Yeah. Effectively fully resolved. If I even was like, I knew my period was coming and I was like, oh man, that cheese looks so good. And I knew my period would start the next day because of my app and how regular my cycle is. I'm like, I cannot even eat that cheese because I know that something will feel not good even if I eat that cheese. So imagine if I know eating cheese will do that. So then after, like yesterday I had some plain yogurt, but I'm done. And now I've got like 20 days, 20 before the next thing. I just know that I can't be continuing to eat dairy, you know. And by the way, my yogurt was zero. It was like very low carbs, just so everyone's wondering. Greek yogurt, plain. <laughs> no carnivore <Huh>. police here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so it's just crazy because I think this could help a lot of teens, a lot of women. Um, I was talking to somebody else and apparently, so I was a teen in the 90s to, in the, the 2000s, I was in my 20s. Um, apparently now, I don't, it's more prevalent and I really think it's because the diet sucks so bad uh, in the U.S. I'm sorry, you'd be totally blunt. There's a big difference between I, I've been living here for eight years. I still had that problem here until I had kids. Mm -hmm. But I think it's what I had done to my body for 30 years. 17 years smoking, French fries, hamburgers, pizza. Uh, if I wanted to lose weight, I would just stop eating so much of that for a little while and then drop some weight and then I would do it again. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. this was, I don't consider it yo-yo dieting. I guess it was, but it was more, oh, if I want to take off a few, few pounds, I'll stop eating the carbs. But then later I, I fit my new pant size. So let me get back into eating my hamburger first again. <laughs> and I think that, so I want to say I was so worried, like, what am I going to do about my daughter? Like, I need to make sure she doesn't go through the pain that I went through. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, when this happens and I had that first menstrual cycle three weeks in the carnivore, I was like, oh my God, this is the solution. But that's crazy. Three weeks in. And it was like a total change. I'm not saying if you start carnivore tomorrow and, you're, and you have a terrible period and it starts the next day, that you're not going to feel pain. Sorry. It takes a little while to, I don't know, I would say give it at least a couple months and like really see how you feel. Mm -hmm. So um, I do want to say that endometriosis is 
gen- p- apparently genetic, and it could be autoimmune also. My mom had terrible periods. Another reason why I thought it was just normal. My grandmother had terrible periods. She was told by a doctor that she would never have children. She proceeded to say, uh, not true. I had, to, I had to figure out what words I was going to say. <laughs> and she proceeded to have six kids. And then, uh, but she had terrible menstrual cycles, apparently, also. That I don't know. I didn't know her. She died years before I was born. But so I could see that maybe there's a genetic aspect. And I was the unlucky one because I asked my sister about this more recently. She's like, no, I never, I never experienced that at all. Wow. So um, that was my tough luck, I guess. But I think that eating correctly and, you know, eating how we're supposed to eat as human beings, women need to eat a lot of fat, but not like this fake fat, not like seed oils. It's super inflammatory, probably contributed to it. Um, we need to eat like animal fats because that's how we've been eating for millions of years. I don't think if people actually felt the way that I did, the human race would even exist if every single woman since time immemorial <laughs> felt like this, we wouldn't have the human race. It's impossible. It is yeah. so painful. And I, and I don't know, like a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, we weren't eating like this. We didn't have all these autoimmune issues. We didn't have all this inflammation. It's impossible um it's almost like this uh this country is a giant science experiment or something oh my god it's so crazy it's it's, so crazy it's so crazy um i can do like anyways let me just women if you have any menstrual problems if you have pcos please do low carb try the carnivore diet for like three months and eliminate everything and see how you feel i'm not even saying you need to stay carnivore forever, but like, see how you feel. And then you can see what things make you react to what. Like, I know if I eat cheese, I'm going to have a problem. Like, for sure, if I'm eating pizza and crap, if I'm eating that crap, I'm for sure going to have problems. But um, I think it really corrects your body. I will say that because I was in, I was eating lot, some crap, but I was still eating lots of, okay, that's a point. I was eating crap when I was in the U.S. And I was eating, but a ton of red meat still. I was still eating meats. I was still eating fats um, and I didn't really have a terrible cycle. Maybe it was a little more annoying than usual, but it wasn't terrible. And um, so I just wanted to point that out there, but because I think the red meat has a lot to do with regulating hormones in your body. But for sure, if I keep going on that path, if I would have stuck on that path, I would just feel terrible all around because I was starting to feel really bad. Glad I'm home. Glad I'm home. (laughs) (laughs) Cool thing. So you mentioned that you have two small children. Right. But what do their diets look like? Uh, you know, at home, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty mm-hmm. good. So um, I live in South America. I live in Colombia. And um, the diet here is not the standard American diet. I think there's like, I live in a city of 500,000. And there's like two McDonald's in the whole city. There's another place they have here called El Corral, which is a burger place that everybody loves. Uh, but... It's, I don't know, there's not a McDonald's on every corner is what I'm trying to say. You're not, you have to like go great distances to get to fast food. Mm. Um, not to say that there's not obese people here, but there's, it's way different. It's way different. Um, and I, it's way different. The food's way different. Look, uh, most people eat, right? Maybe lentils, beans. There's some salad, like salad on your plate. Like a normal plate for lunch is going to be rice, beans, uh, salad, some meat in a soup that's like commonly what people eat here Mm -hmm. um and that doesn't sound very healthy but if it's home cooked it's not totally i mean people go to restaurants but that's what you're gonna find in a restaurant and most restaurants also and people are not obese here they're not overweight i can't eat rice and beans it tears up my stomach Mm -hmm. sorry won't do it love it but won't do it tastes delicious won't do it right um but like the kids here look healthy they look skinny and people, maybe people that are super overweight would be like, oh, they're too skinny. No, I think that's how, like, a kid is supposed to look, actually. <laughs> they're supposed to look like, I don't know, they have a tiny body. They're not supposed to be super over, they're not supposed to have any chub on it, I don't think. Because mm-hmm. knowing how I was as a kid, I was very chubby, but I ate, you know, Doritos, French fries, hot dogs, hamburgers, pizza. My kids don't eat that regularly. We did in the U.S. when I was home, and it was like, I felt like it was like overnight. How my son changed. I wish I had a photo. I wish I had two photos so I could pop them up, but, or maybe I'll send them over to you, but, mm-hmm. or maybe not. Maybe YouTube won't like that. Anyways, 
He is a beautiful little boy. Oh my God, he's gorgeous. He's so cute. Uh, so smart, so intelligent. And then we go to the US and it was like, he's definitely my child. <laughs> <laughs> pizza french fries can we try mcdonald's i've never tried mcdonald's before literally he's like can we please go to mcdonald's i've never eaten there before so then we're going to mcdonald's i'm like oh no i'm like okay just while we're here i'm not gonna do this again at home we went to um there's this place in rockford illinois and i love it it's called the golden chopsticks i even like i broke one day. i'm like okay jeff my uncle let's go to the golden chopstick and it's an all-you-can-eat chinese food buffet uh, um <laughs> Guess what my 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 son got? French fries, a plate full of rice, pizza, okay, things of ice cream, and then he's like, "Mom, the food is so good. Why does my stomach hurt?" <laughs> oh wow! So I'm actually I love that he had that experience, so he can have some like intuitive eating and know how we eat at home, mm-hmm. which is like meat based, eggs, pork like pork belly, um, they have fruit available for them. That's generally how we eat at home. But I'm so, I, it was terrible, but I'm glad that he was like, wait a second, why does my stomach hurt terribly? Why do I feel so bad? Mm-hmm. And his little belly, his flat belly, just, you know, he got a little chub. His face was super inflamed. I'm like, he literally looked like a, a completely different child. I'm like, we lived in the o- U.S. and I wasn't like strict. He would be obese overnight. He was chubby, not obese, but and now he came back here and he's like, if, if the inflammation went away, if the weight went down. That's what I'm saying. Like it almost reverses. Plus kids are so resilient, but it was just so crazy to me. How that happened? Like what? How is this possible? How are you? How did this happen? You look like a different child. <laughs> I know how it happens, but I was, I was shocked. Literally, we were there for a month in the U.S. I was shocked how fast a small child could just put weight on and look chubby all of a sudden. Like, I didn't think that because he's been here. He eats like a horse. He eats tons of food. Mm -hmm. He's eating the right food, but even not, he could eat like a bowl of rice and not put on a bowl of rice and meats and not gain any weight at all. So that says something also about the food. Another point I just want to bring up in addition to that. So here where I live, we live in a gated community. Um, there's five buildings inside the community. There's security guards all around. They know basically everybody and all the kids. There must be at least 2000 people that live in this community. There's like this little parking lot and right across the street from the park, like you go down the elevator and you cross this teeny little parking lot and you're at the park inside the community. Um, and there's tons of space. So he's able to, he's seven and we're totally fine. All the kids whatever age they're just outside playing and the parents we feel very safe here to just let our kids be there we can look out the window we can see our kids security's there um a couple parents if there's some parents outside they kind of keep an eye on your kids and you keep an eye on theirs that's how the community is so Mm -hmm. he's able to be outside from like three in the afternoon to like eight o'clock at night he leaves he's like i'm gonna go find my friends uh and he goes and plays for hours out in the sun this is so healthy this is what kids need to do. We're in the U.S. We can't do that. I can't, I can't let him first in Illinois, it's freezing. And I can't let him, even if we're in safe areas, be outside by himself for hours. And I had to work. It was just, I think it was a combination of factors for sure, the food. But it's so important that we let our kids be outside. Is they need to be outside like five hours a day. I think this is what, we're about the same age, Adam. And I think this is how we were in the 90s, right? We're just like, running amok outside and get out of school. You don't show up for hours. Saturday, Sunday, you're outside with your friends all day. And I think this is a very different culture now where kids are inside, we're streaming, we're watching TV, we're playing video games. Not that I didn't play video games. I was definitely a video game player in the 90s. But we're on, we're always connected to devices. And unfortunately, because I had to work and I didn't have the same setup, my son was watching a lot more TV than he usually does. And my daughter. Um, I don't, I'm not bringing my daughter up a lot because she actually didn't gain any weight, but she was very picky about her food. Like if she wanted pizza, she would eat like a bite of pizza. And I fall, didn't want to eat anymore. So uh, the lack of food, (laughs) I mean, she did eat a lot. She did eat fine, but she wasn't like, she wasn't like down yet. Like on Halloween, she ate a few pieces of candy. I'm like, Jacob, stop eating all the candy. You're going to be puking all day. And then I bought their candy from them afterwards. I let them have some and I bought the rest. Um, 
anyways, so that's like the difference between the children. She was selective and he was all, he was all, all in. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, so are there any favorite meals that you guys make for the kids that they like? Oh, yeah. So we get pork belly and we get it grinded up. And I talk about this a lot. You go to your butcher and you get pork belly mm -hmm. grinded up two times um, with the skin and the fat and the meat and everything. And you have like this mush that you, you, you can make little patties out of it and salt it. And we make it. It's like chicken nuggets. And they love that. They will eat that almost every day. If, if we made it every day, they would eat it every day. So nice. that's their favorite one because, you know, kids love chicken nuggets. And this is like it tastes so much better than chicken nuggets. And it's so simple. That's awesome. Yeah. So is is chicken feet one of their favorite? I know, but I love chicken feet. Tastes like French fries in here. <laughs> ah, they sell chicken feet here. Okay, this is a different. Here's another thing about this culture. You don't waste anything. There, it's like in the U.S. We have this culture. I used to waste so much food. I don't know. Did you ever waste food? Like you would order something and you wouldn't eat it all, or you'd buy something and it would just sit in the fridge and rot. Oh yeah. Like vegetables. All the all the time. <laughs> So in this culture, it's a big problem. You don't waste anything. And I think that has to do with the fact that like in the U.S., one reason is it's easy for us to make money. And here, the culture on finances is a lot different. Like people make a lot less money than we do, have the ability to do in the U.S. I'm not saying everyone's rich in the U.S., but I think that mindset, like it's not a problem to waste things, has something to do with the fact that it, it is possibly easy to make money. Okay. Here, you can't waste. So... Why am I saying all this? Okay, so you're going to eat everything. You're going to eat the organs. You're going to eat the the chicken feet. Not the bones. You're going to eat the skin. Fried chicken feet. <laughs> Salt and literally things like potato chips. It's so good. Um, But you're not going to waste. Like you go to the butcher and you will find every part of the cow. If you go to the butcher, I don't know. I've never really been to a butcher in the U.S., but I don't think you're going to find every, literally every piece of the cow is there because they don't want to waste. And I think that's an appropriate way that human beings should be thinking. We have to eat animals to optimally survive. So don't waste that food because that's also not fair to that animal. Mm -hmm. So um, I know like here people love liver. They don't eat all of the, I, I mean, I don't see people like obsessively eating all the organ meats, but uh, they're there for sale and people do eat them. Uh, oh. By the way, chicken livers, air fried, like cut up, air fried and salted. So so good in a crispy make sure it's crispy on the outside <laughs> but um no i don't i don't know i've had to like i've learned a lot of things living in this culture that is totally separate from the united states um another thing that has nothing to do with carnivore but like people smile at you here you walk down the street people talk to you you say hi to almost everybody my husband has to correct me he didn't say you didn't say hi to them as we walked by them like you looking at his phone <laughs> like, so that, that's usually my response if I don't say hi like I like my justifying not saying hi to somebody but like if you want to talk to somebody here you say good evening xyz ask your question in the U.S. I was like I walk into the bathroom I'm like hey is there a line in here and that's totally like our culture we're just you know just get into it but here you're gonna say hi you don't smile at people over there I, I think I think you're not walking down the street smiling you're not saying hi and I love that about this culture. I think it's a, a part of the whole thing. People are so friendly. Uh, they have very specific ways that they eat. Uh, mm -hmm. There's like a, a big community. I mean, I read that Colombia is the friendliest country in South America. So that might have something to do with it. Right. <laughs> people are just so friendly here. Um, but it's just nice because when I went home, I'm like, people don't smile here. But I've been here for so long. Do you get? Mm -hmm. So I've been here for so long. So I've gotten so used to this. So I just started saying hi to people. <laughs> I'm going to make somebody's day. I'm going to say hi. Hey, how are you? Right. <laughs> Not just going about to raise. Hey, there were lying in here. <laughs> yeah, I, that I, that happens here a lot. We're not the friendliest country. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'll go out on a walk, even in the woods. Hi, okay. how you doing? Howdy, whatever. Yeah. As we walk past somebody and they're, they're always, you know, <laughs> at, at the time, I don't even get a response or a grunt. It's, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm like, they must be inflamed. <laughs> That's right. I'm so happy you brought that up. So the second day I was in the U.S., we went to Costco, and I bought my stuff for the week because I was really planning on being up strict. I was planning on being good. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, people don't smile. Why aren't people smiling? They look unhappy. And then I'm like, I wonder if it has something to do with all this. 
poop they're eating. I'm, I'm selecting my words about all the bad stuff that they're eating. Because maybe mm-hmm. they're like, they feel miserable. Maybe it's not you. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not, yeah. you can't take it personal because I think people are so stuck in their minds about how they feel. They're stuck in their minds because they're, they're not sleeping. They're eating improperly. People feel anxiety. They feel depression. They feel all of these things. And it's so connected to how they're eating. And I was like, I really wonder if there's some relationship here to why people accidentally seem unfriendly. You get what I'm saying? And, and you yeah. know, don't talk to strangers, blah, 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 blah. Do you know how many strangers I talk to? Okay. All right. I will segue <laughs> for a second. So here, I had to learn this. Here, there's people outside the grocery store. They're not taxis. They're just some people that are trying to make some extra money. And they will offer to drive you home. At first, I was like, I'm not getting into a stranger's car. I'm so done with that over eight years. I'll be like, somebody's outside the bus terminal. You want to give me a ride? Sure, let's go. Uh, <laughs> how much do you want? Like, totally safe. Do you get what I'm saying? You just pay them a right. couple bucks and they will drive you wherever you want to go. We also use Uber and driver. I'm just saying that does happen here. So I'm in the US. It's freezing. I'm in Chicago. I'm with my sister-in-law. We have my kid. My daughter hates the weather. She's itchy all over. She doesn't know why because it's so cold. That's how Chicago is. Mm-hmm. She's complaining. We went, I didn't read the GPS, like the the Google map, right? If I would have gone one way in two minutes, we would have been to the, in five minutes, we would have been to the bus, uh, the train station. We went the other way. So we're wandering around. I keep asking people like, where's the train station? They're like, oh, it's that way. Pointing me in the wrong direction. So they didn't know, obviously. (laughs) And I go to a gas station with my sister-in-law and my kids. And um, I'm asking the the clerk, hey, do you know where this, this train station is? And he's like, no idea. And then some very nice man he looks like a polar bear he's so nice i could just tell it like i have a good perception of people and he's trying to explain me where it is and and he's like i'm so sorry i'm like is there any way you can drive us i will pay you can you please drive us and my sister-in-law i don't know what she's thinking <laughs> <laughs> but i'm asking this guy please drive us he's like yeah sure i'll drive you and he's like you don't have to pay me and i felt totally safe because i've been doing this for years now right. you get what i'm saying like <laughs> Oh, there's a guy here. He can drive me. Right. And so he was so nice. He was really nice. I'm glad I have a good ability to like observe people. But I think my sister-in-law thought I was nuts getting in this guy's pickup truck. Probably in America for sure. Yeah, in America. And I'm like, (laughs) no, no, this guy's nice. He wouldn't have, first of all, he wouldn't have stopped and said, like, he's like, oh yeah, I have kids. It's rough. It's really cold outside. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, sure. I'll drive you. And it was only like, that was like five minutes away in my car. So. And I just chatted him up the whole time in case he wanted to kill us. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I wasn't scared at all. But, oh, man. Afterwards, I told my brother. And he's like, you got in a random person's car with my wife? Not even like you got in a random person's car with your kids. I think that's what he said anyway. Right. <laughs> Anyways, it's just like the culture here is so different. And actually, it's nice if you transfer that culture to another country and mm-hmm. just like, People actually anywhere are beautiful and they're nice. It's just, I think going back to this point of people are so introverted and, and I think it has a lot to do with how bad they feel physically. And if you are on the proper human diet, maybe you get out of that a little bit, you feel a little bit more happiness, you feel less anxiety, you feel less depression. Um, and maybe you're willing to smile a bit more at your neighbor. I, 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 I'm sure. Again, let's go back to if people were this rotten, really, a million years ago, we wouldn't have a human race. So you got to know that there's decency underneath everything and people really want to love other people and be friends and share that affinity with other people. But if you feel like crap, you feel like crap and you, you can see it in another person so easily. Sorry. Absolutely. Hope this helps anybody. <laughs> I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that because I had the, the depression and the anxiety and, and just not feeling good and the brain fog and stay away from me. I was mm-hmm. a friendly mm-hmm. guy and uh, I, I would do everything I could to avoid people. Mm. Uh, and now it's just, it's normal. But on the other side now, I noticed how I was. These mm-hmm. people were, they avert their eyes. They right. try to stay away from you mm-hmm. and uh, stuff like that. And I do believe that it is because of their diet and how they're eating. Sure. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. Yeah, because I, I used to, I've talked to a lot of people in my life. I love talking to people. I always have. And um, like I know deep down, most people want friends and they want love and they want, I've just always been that way. I've always been like trying to like 
make people happy, make people laugh. That's just part of who I am. So feeling also like crap for years. I'm like, where did my happiness go? <laughs> Why can't I feel like I used to feel? <laughs> right. And, yeah. you know, I, this year has really been a year for me of like um, healing physically, mentally, spiritually. Uh, I've been doing other stuff also, not just my diet, but the diet was definitely helping so that I could accomplish other things. I had like a project that I was over that I've been working on for years. I was never able to finish it. And just finishing that relieved so much stress in my life, like mental stress to be able to complete that. So, but I had more stability because I was sleeping and eating correctly. Mm -hmm. You have to care for yourself. Oh, I'll plug, especially if you're mom, you're a mom of kids, like small kids or adults. I don't know. I don't have adults yet, but a mom of small kids, you have to take care of yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, there's no way you can be there for them. And they need you there for them. They need you to be that light and that love and that uh, direction. And if you just, if they just see you, you know, you're working all day and then you leave and you're like, hey, kids, let's go to that couch that's three feet away and just sit and watch TV. Like, that's not good. That's not good. And uh, right after starting Carnivore, I was like, literally right afterwards, I was like, Oh my God, let's go to the park. It's right outside. Let's go to the pool. It's right outside. Like, wait, we've been living here for so long. Uh, yeah, I love movies. I'm definitely like a movie addict, but I want to, I'll do that when my kids are asleep. Do you hear what I'm saying? Uh, now I'm going to spend the time with my kids because I feel good and I want to do something with them. Not saying I never did anything with them before, but I definitely noticed my activity level coming up and I'm able to, I want to share beautiful experiences with them not share Disney movies. <laughs> right. Yeah. Disney. I don't want Disney movies to be their only memory of their mom. But when you feel bad, you don't want to do anything. You're already exhausted. You've been working all day. You're done. You just want to sit down. That's so bad. Going from one chair to another. <laughs> and then going to your bed. Terrible idea. <laughs> right. There yeah. you go. That's I, my story, Morning Glory. I agree with that. As a father, I wish that I had found the carnivore diet years decades ago because my boys are in their mid-20s now and they're gone but yeah. yeah i can't even imagine how much more fun it would have been if i actually had energy <laughs> i mean because it it was just you know working 55 hours a week you know you come home you just you're super tired you don't want to do anything you know typical what you would see on an American sitcom. Yeah. Just that would work. Come home, sit down, and that's it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Put the Al Bundy, put the TV on. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, man. So if somebody's considering the carnivore diet, what kind of tips would you have for that person? Um, I would say, I always say, like, if you're considering this, like, get everything out of the house. Like, just take a garbage bag. Someone didn't like that I said throw it away. And I say throw it away because it's not real food. But somebody commented to me like a homeless person will eat anything. Okay, fine. Whatever. However you feel, just get it out of your house. I would throw it away, donate it to something um, if you feel that's appropriate. And just put in your house foods that are kind of war foods. Um, like yesterday, I was starving. And if I had junk in my house, I would have eaten that. But I didn't have junk, so I had to make a steak. And now I'm full. And I don't feel bad. I feel great. So you have to have the foods in your house and get anything out of the house that's not appropriate. Um, smart would be to have like egg, boiled eggs, easily accessible or better yet, bacon, easily accessible, like already cooked. So if you have a craving for something, you can eat that. I, I say this at the beginning. Obviously, you don't want to just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating because if you don't use that energy, you're not going to lose weight anyways. <laughs> you might not gain weight, but you might not lose weight. But right. I say at the beginning, eat enough. Eat so much. Eat as much as you want because you want to heal your body and you don't want to like feel like you can't have something that you're used to. So like, and maybe when you start, you'll have cravings and stuff. So just like eat that bacon, like eat as much as you need to. But when you're eating, eat like big meals. So you're satiated until your next meal. But I, I say at the beginning, like, don't worry about how much you're actually eating. This is not about losing weight at this point. This is like getting unaddicted to addictive substances because that's what 99% of the food in your grocery store is, uh, is, is, is an addictive substance and isn't real food. And it's just there to make you sick. And that's what it does. So that's why I say at the beginning, do that. Um, find the meals you like because you're not going to actually keep eating so many different things on the carnivore diet. You could. There's so many foods you could eat. 
you can eat shrimp, you can eat fish, you can eat all of this, you can eat chicken, you can do whatever you, whatever you want, like in the animal kingdom, basically. And, um, but you're going to find that you go to your three basic things. Like I eat eggs, I eat pork belly, I eat steak, sometimes I'll eat chicken. Sometimes, like today, I'm actually craving chicken livers for the last <laughs> few days. But that's the other point is that your body is actually, when you get unaddicted to those foods, your body's going to actually tell you what it needs. Like, there's a reason I, I feel like eating chicken livers. There's probably some vitamin in there that my body needs. Do you get what I'm saying? And so you, you will learn that. So I know I'm going a little bit off of like, how should you start? But start by getting the stuff out of your house that's not a carnivore food and replace it with carnivore foods and have prepared enough different foods so that if you get hungry, you can just eat something easily and uh, stick with it. Some people say take electrolytes. See if that works for you if you need to do that. I think the biggest thing is just to get over that initial hump of the change because from going from like eating how I was eating at Columbia, which isn't perfect. And definitely there's like highly processed foods I was eating here. Uh, and it's still somehow completely different than the U.S. Because being at home and then coming back here. Oh, man, I had, I think, a harder time getting off of that food. Like I was craving things. I mean, I've been back like a couple of weeks, so it wasn't that bad. But getting off of it, I had the crazy carnivore diarrhea that I didn't have before. So that I just th think that's an indicator of how bad the food can be. Mm -hmm. You don't have to eat that stuff in the US. It's just how bad the food can be and what it does to your guts. So then coming back home and getting back on this plan, I was like, yeah, I was having some cravings, but it was that. It was like, oh my God, I didn't experience this before. I've literally been doing this for eight months. How is this possible? Two weeks? Like right. two weeks of this? This is crazy. Anyway, so just get over that initial hump and stay the course. And I also say, like, write down all of your successes. Like, or if something bad happens, write it down. Write down every single change. But then you can, like, go back and see um, the changes. I might even say do your blood work. Not required. But if you're curious, do your blood work before you start and then do it three months later. So you can see, oh, I'm not killing your, I'm not killing myself. I'm actually, I'm actually, my health is actually improving through these blood markers. But you don't have to do that. But keep a list, get the crap out of your house, uh, eat as much as you need to, and stick with it while you get over that that first, the withdrawal period. I don't want to call it keto flu. It's literally withdrawing from toxic substances that you are consuming daily. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's great. That's great information, especially the getting the things out of your house. That's so important. My family, they still eat somewhat of a standard American diet and having those things you just even while I'm doing the carnivore diet, it's still a temptation because it's prepared food. You don't it's so easy to just go in and grab it off the shelf. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, and then satiate that that hunger real quick. Uh but you know, I, I have to fight it every time. Every oh, single wow. time. <laughs> get, make some bacon. Get that bacon. Get your little and put it in little Ziploc bags. Right. It's a good thing that I have high willpower. Uh, I can't resist those things. But if you're not a person that has a high willpower, definitely get the stuff out of the house. I realized that at my sister's house. <laughs> <laughs> I gave myself freedom for being on vacation to do it. But I'm like, nah, it's so much easier if it's not in your house. If it's not available to you, you're not going to be like, hmm. I will say I did not eat one Pop-Tart. <laughs> and there was a box of Pop-Tarts. I'm like, why are there Pop-Tarts here? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you gross. Like, at least I'm going to save myself for something a little bit more delicious than a Pop-Tart. Like, but some yeah, people, I, I wouldn't have uh, a year ago. I was a non-discriminatory carboholic. <laughs> for sure. And now, now, I'm, now I'll be at least discriminatory if I decide to go off. But I'm not going to eat the Pop-Tart. But a year ago, I would have for sure. If there was, right. like, if I was having a craving, that's the thing. I don't have these, like, some people, I'm so sorry, we're almost done an hour, but some people have like food addictions and I for sure had a food addiction. Like it's a non-discriminatory. If I wanted, if I had a craving and all there was was Pop-Tarts, I would eat two or three Pop-Tarts. And you wonder mm -hmm. why I gained weight. But that's like, get the food out of your house. Right. It'll make your life so much easier. And it will heal your relationship with food. Food is not for pleasure. It's not for sadness. It's not for, uh, food is if you're hungry. So you give your body fuel, but we have created this whole system uh especially in chicago we love food in the midwest i don't know if it's the same in ohio but oh, yeah. uh, you go you eat food for a funeral you eat food for a wedding you eat food for 
You eat food because you want to eat food because it looks good. You eat food because uh, there's a great restaurant that you want to try out. All these reasons that are not the right reasons. Mm, absolutely. Food is to fuel your body. And when you eat the right fuel, you feel great. And when you eat the wrong fuel, you break your, your dang car. Your car breaks down. There you go. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so where can everybody find you on the internet, Alia? Uh, you can find me at my YouTube channel. Please come and subscribe. Let's <laughs> <laughs> plug Alia Wells with my face. And my hair is like this. There you go. <laughs> oh, only with the, the picture that looks like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Then don't go to the other Alia Wells. She's yeah. in India. She's an actress, apparently. <laughs> no, I'm just so, are you serious? No, there's an Alia Bahat or something. So if you type in Alia, that might pop up first. <laughs> ah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll make sure that we... in India. I might be totally wrong in making that yeah. up, but there is another Alia out there who has a lot more subscribers, and I don't think she talks about the Kangaroo diet. <laughs> well, we'll make sure that we link the right one. In the... <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks for the chat today, Alia. Yeah. And thank you for your inspiration to women out there that there is hope with endometriosis and even with just maybe even getting their cycle regular on right. the carnivore diet. So appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me.